Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another episode of CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of CIO Programs here at IDG, and I'm very pleased to have with me today Vince Kellen, who is the CIO of the University of California at San Diego. Vince joined UC uh, San Diego back in 2016 to provide leadership and management of all aspects of IT, resources, and program initiatives. Last year, this university was ranked as the 15th best university in the world by the prestigious academic ranking of world universities. Vince is also responsible at UC San Diego for supporting an innovative and robust IT environment across the campus. The university is a $5 billion enterprise that is home to 16 Nobel laureates, 20,000 employees, and more than 39,000 students taking 100 different degree programs. Before he arrived in San Diego, Vince was the senior vice provost for analytics and technologies at the University of Kentucky, where he spent eight years. In addition to his current role at UC San Diego, he has been since 2007 a senior consultant and fellow in the Cutter Consortium's Business Technology Council. And like many of his peers in CIO Plus augmented roles, Vince has served on advisory boards for numerous IT companies and technology vendors, and today he is a member of SAP's Customer Advisory Board. Throughout his career, he's also authored four books on database technology and more than 200 articles and presentations on IT and business strategy topics. Vince, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, and I thought we ought to dive in right now. Most of our audience may not be as familiar with the way digital transformation and the issues that we we write and talk so much about in this industry, the way they are impacting higher ed. So I wanted you to kind of give us a 50,000-foot view of how digital transformation, what it means for higher ed today and what you see in the near-term future. Sure, and higher education is a really big market uh, with lots of different interesting players from our traditional universities, of which we are, uh, to many that are much more focused online and professional education. So we got a whole range. But broadly speaking, universities have three basic missions. One of them is to help with uh, education Mm -hmm. uh, and teaching and instruction. Another mission related to research, which is often very tech, uses a lot of technology. And the third one is um, using technology in our own administration and our own efficiencies uh, that we try to get. And what's happening in higher education is happening in business. And that is the inclusion of a ton of technology in many things we do. We're somewhat aided by the fact that we have young students who are coming in with a a collection of technologies between cell phones, iPads, laptops, gaming devices, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our universities are chock full of computers and devices. Uh, So we're very technology rich in terms of the number of uh, pieces Mm -hmm. of technology around us. Uh, And so the transformation is now hitting broadly across all these missions. Uh, and it's causing uh, a lot of change, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of technology adoption challenges because of all the change, uh, and uh, a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, as well. Yeah. Well, and, that, and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about taking advantage of that kind of opportunity, because uh, I know when we, sp- when we spoke last week, uh, we talked a little bit about this increasing digitization of the processes, um, the adoption of practices, the business processes, products, that how all of that is proceeding probably at a higher rate of uh, speed than it did in the past. Oh, no question. Uh, All all universities are using modern, uh, what we call enterprise systems, ERP systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, we have many pieces of software to handle our our various business processes. Uh, But even something as simple as, you know, when you graduate a university and you have a transcript and later in life you want to apply for a master's degree, you call us and say, I want my transcript sent over. 
Yeah. Well, that's now getting digitized and mm-hmm. probably in the near future will be a, a subject to blockchain technology. Yeah. Uh, in which much of that gets automated. Uh, so, yes, we're seeing that continual. It's like the waves coming to shore every period mm-hmm. of time. There's another thing, another process to opt, uh, to optimize and improve. We have one wrinkle in higher ed. We are the land of complex operations, so we have mm-hmm. a lot of processes. Many of our processes handle a smaller number of transactions, which is very different than a larger corporation, which might have fewer processes and a very large number of transactions. Mm-hmm. And as an example, our philosophy department may hire a faculty or so every few years. So it's a process they have to execute, but not very frequently. We got a lot of processes like that in higher education. Mm-hmm. Now, has the the proliferation of all the tools and technologies, what, how much has that changed the classroom experience for the students at both at UC San Diego and the other universities that you've seen? Because you're you're very active in the in the yeah. education community. Well, that that's kind of a bipolar answer. On one side, you can walk into most university and still see students sitting in seats much as they did 100 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you still see the primacy of the face-to-face interaction. Yeah. But what's been going on uh, in some cases quietly, but in some cases with a lot of public fanfare, is a lot of use of internet video and audio streaming, mm-hmm. uh, lecture capture, Uh, interaction devices within the classroom and outside the classroom to enrich the learning experience digitally. And every major university is very focused on that, as Mm -hmm. are we. Yeah. Do you think, is it likely when you look ahead and think about the next five to 10 years, is it likely that the major universities will all have a hugely significant online presence? Like they may actually end up with more students online than they do in the classroom? Are we heading well, that's a, that yeah, way that's this a, quickly? Uh, in the five-year window, no. Okay. In the 10-year window, we will probably grow our digital interactions uh, in the areas of what we call relearners, adult learners who are coming back multiple times throughout their career. Mm-hmm. And that's more likely the case where we'll see more online. At that 18 to 22, 23-year-old range, I think we're still likely to see a lot of face-to-face on-premise education Mm -hmm. uh, because more than just education occurs at the university. In many ways, the students are are trying out their independence from their families for the very first time. Yeah. Uh, And and universities have that role, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and one of the things that uh, we talked about previously, which I thought was a very interesting take on it, was uh, the idea that human beings shape technology more than the opposite. And and the view today seems to be that technology is changing our brains and that children exposed to screens at the age of two years old, that their brains are rewiring and all. But you have a different take on that. Yeah, I do. And it's certainly informed by my PhD work in the area area of cognitive psychology and learning. Mm -hmm. And um, while there is some measure of neuroplasticity in the brain, the brain is structured in such a way to process information in in a very peculiar and human way. And so uh, I, I, I flip it around and I say, rather than think about how technology may be changing us, let's flip it around and see how do humans shape the technology to suit their goal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I was speaking at uh, a few years back at a distance learning conference in Florida, and I started the very first sentence of my presentation was, I was at this distance learning conference in Florida when I had an epiphany. Mm -hmm. I paused to see if the audience would get it. And the epiphany was, why are we here in Florida face-to-face at a distance learning conference. Talking about distance learning, yeah. Why aren't we doing this all All at a distance? At a distance. Um, And (laughs) my point has been that when higher education goes completely virtual and Mm -hmm. learning is actually superior in a virtual environment than any face-to-face environment, then so too will be many other human experiences. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, society would have been massively reshaped. And the question I would ask myself is whether I should take the red pill or the blue pill Uh (laughs) in a reference to Matrix. Uh, So I kind of invoke what I call the Worfian principle, which Mm -hmm. is really borrowing from Star Trek and Worf when asked by the Borg to 
uh, embrace assimilation into the Borg, uh, Worf responds, no, thank you. I like my species the way it is. Yeah. And many human beings mm -hmm. like the face-to-face. -face. They like the, <clears throat> the personal contact. They like the interaction with facilities and, and an environment. And when the artificial world becomes equivalent to that, that's a pretty scary place. And mm -hmm. uh, for the next five to ten years, that's not going to be the issue. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're going to end up in, in a balanced state <laughs> between on-premise, face-to-face, and use of online. And I think we're already seeing the contours of that line being drawn here yeah. pretty well. Well, and it, as we talked about, this is uh, the, your Warfian principle is actually uh, fairly good news for my business when, in the face-to-face -face conferences that we do with CIOs because we haven't seen those are continuing to be very well populated and profitable for the business, whereas so many other forms, especially in publishing, have been overtaken by digital but not the face-to-face -face conferences. Those still, those still matter, that ability to get together and talk with each other. Yeah, and human beings have been doing that since the dawn of civilization. So mm -hmm. it'll be very hard to unravel that. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the disruption going on in your industry and the changing customer demands. Because I tend to think that any business public or public university or private dealing with the 18 to 23 year old population is going to be dealing with a lot of expectations about technology advances and so forth. So uh, talk about the way disruption itself is changing your incoming customers and how higher ed is responding to that. Yeah, I think for our students, they're coming in with a great expectation for how the universities can fulfill upon an education experience that's enriched with all of this technology. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, that's one pressure we're getting. Another pressure we're getting is from what I call our citizen stakeholders and federal governments and state governments mm -hmm. to find ways to make to ensure that higher education is cost effective. So we have a lot of external demands to say, hey, can you use technology to lower your cost structure mm -hmm. and keep your costs in line? Uh, so we got pressure from both sides here, both from the student to enrich the environment that they're in, mm -hmm. uh, and then from our citizen stakeholders to use technology to be efficient. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Okay. Well, and how do you, when you think about the... Uh, well, diversifying markets that are bringing more of their education products online. Um, I it was interesting. The observation that you made when we talked earlier was that the Internet One, the online universities, when they first showed up, that as a big disruptive force, that didn't really take root. Uh, explain that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, when we go back to the 90s, um, late 90s mm -hmm. uh, and the early noughts, when some of the for-profit universities come out and really push online learning, a lot of what you saw or what I saw was what I call Model T type engineering, which is mm -hmm. one class now big, done even larger. So a very tightly controlled bit of content uh, and a very scalable sort of delivery function. So basically a bigger mass manufacturing floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously those models, as we look at them today, did not stick for a couple reasons. One, I think they were trying to cover out new markets for which the cost effectiveness ratio wasn't so high. And in fact, the ballooning debt of students was born more than half by students who attended those types of universities. But I think what we're seeing coming up now is a little different, even from some of the for-profits, which is trying to be extremely cost-effective and a little more tailored and a little more personalized for the learner. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got a little startup like Minerva, which is doing uh, using technology in a great way for a very small population of students right now. A university like Governor Western University, uh, which has been quietly making inroads at this cost effectiveness and digital realm. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're starting to see those continue to grow, but we're also seeing the elites, the Harvards, the MITs, even universities like us that are now really jumping in and, and trying to master the digital education realm. Mm -hmm. What's uh, Give us an example of something that UC San Diego has done in the last year in that digital realm, something that students in the outside world would notice. Well, f first of all, we've got a fair number of, of uh, content and courses up in Coursera, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been doing that for a while now. And we're coming out with some Master's of Science degrees in data science uh, uh, in the edX environment, and that'll be coming in the next year. 
So we're we've already been in kind of uh, in the the certificate realm, uh, meaning non-degreed in Coursera, mm-hmm. but now we're starting to move some of our degreed programs right up to uh, edX. Okay, and who's our friend who's joining us for this? <laughs> Yeah, really. <laughs> Is it just one? He's noisy. <laughs> yeah. I have yeah, I have two miniature dachshunds, and they think that they're Rottweilers. And so when they bark yeah. and I'm on the phone, it's you can hear them all over the house. <laughs> um, let me see. Back to um, – and you had mentioned, too, the, about how much the market is diversifying, how Arizona State, for instance, is getting massively big. Yes, Arizona State's been making great inroads and, and, and expanding their digital realm and increasing their enrollment. Mm-hmm. Their strategy is to try to serve uh, more of their constituents in a bigger way. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a, a very interesting and good strategy for higher education. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're seeing in the East Coast, South, in, in New Hampshire, uh, the university there, that's been uh, very successful in trying to grow its online. Uh, I think... Uh, some things Ohio State did to provide blended learning uh, mm-hmm. activities a few years back is is exemplary. So we're you're seeing a number of universities take initiatives yeah. uh, differently, and so I think this diversity of approach is exactly mm-hmm. what is in order mm-hmm. for the market. That's great. Well, because one of the observations you made is that the big brands need to get bigger, but the small brands have to do that as well, and they'll probably yeah. do it in different ways. Yeah, in the online space here, it's really about brand warfare mm-hmm. and uh, how brands then compete with each other across a larger geography. Mm-hmm. Most universities are very geographically driven. When you go into the online space, you can now go global. Mm-hmm. But when you do go global, you are now f- falling into what I call brand warfare 101. Yeah. And so you really have to enhance your brand and bring it forward. And uh, so the bigger, highly branded universities certainly have an advantage, and the smaller universities have to carve out their niche and build their brand. Mm -hmm. And doesn't it require a a very different, a deeper understanding of the markets you're serving when you go international, for instance? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. International, even even across the United States, you, you really have to do good market analysis and market research. We're trying to do that here in San Diego uh, with our digital offerings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you really have to meet the market now. Yeah. So yep. uh, in the past, universities would build some buildings and attract audiences from the from the local geography uh, In the digital realm. It looks much more like conventional digital business. Okay, interesting. Well, and that it kind of naturally brings us into talking a little bit more about data science. And you mentioned you've got a master's degree program coming up in that that will be offered in a digital realm um, in data science and that you've got a lot of kids that are rushing to get degrees in data science. Um, talk a little bit more about that because uh, I know that this is a trend, uh, well, AI and machine learning and digital science that you're very bullish on over the next decade. Yeah, absolutely. Um, data continues to grow, mm-hmm. um, both its diversity, its volume, and the speed with which it's coming. Uh, so that's continuing. Uh, we're finding all sorts of uses for that data in driving value in, in different ways. Um, the problem is, in a land of complex interactions or complex processes, it's not like you can have one algorithm that will control everything. Mm-hmm. You're going to have hundreds and hundreds of different approaches, uh, what we call analytical approaches, based upon the particular problem. And that's the land of data science. How do you design uh, an environment that can handle a lot of different machine learning, AI, and conventional uh, BI sort of analytics going on to support what the university is trying to do? This is occurring in industry in a big way, as we know. Uh, data, mm-hmm. The term data lake has grown up to refer to a larger collection of data that could be you know, tapped for usage later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we're doing that as well, as many universities are uh, in responding to it. Uh, I think this is a trend that is, to me, this is the analytical trend is much more significant and much more serious. It's probably not quite as big as Internet 1.0, but, mm-hmm. but nearly. Mm -hmm. And that's going to last over the next 10 to 20 years. A lot of insight on the research that we're getting, how to design and and make new things at nanoscale or new uh, medical techniques and technologies are driven by exotic forms of analytics. Uh, 
-hmm. And this is going to become much more common. A big reason it's getting complex is silicon is kind of tapped out in terms of its power. Mm -hmm. And hence, we have to speciate or diversify the approaches we take in order to continue to handle the large increase of data coming at us. Okay. Uh, so I think this is a huge area for the next decade. I would tell all students, you know, just like in uh, the movie The Graduate. You know, <laughs> plastics, plastics, my boy, yes. I would say data science. Data, data science, science. Data science. Any, any field that you want, data science. Well, I've been, uh, and whenever, you know, anybody who's a young person seeking advice, which usually they never do, but I'm always saying go into technology or healthcare because I feel like those two industries are going to rule the earth. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and healthcare is is certainly got a strong demographic component because here in the United States we have end of life care mm -hmm. uh, for the baby boom generation, which is driving a lot of this. Yeah. Uh, so it will have a kind of an ebb and flow to it as well. But I think this data realm is a permanent feature mm -hmm. of the economy, not permanent, but a feature of this economy for the next 20 years. Yeah. Well, let's talk uh, more specifically about the way you have the big projects, the business and technology initiatives that are leading for you at, at UC San Diego. And I believe the top one you mentioned to me is that you're modernizing all the transactional systems and then now your data warehouse is essentially it's it's a machine learning platform now uh, talk a little bit more about that and explain yeah absolutely first we're right in the middle of replacing our ancient COBOL systems which we actually have still today driving our business processes of finance and payroll etc yeah. with modern ERP but as part of that, we're also completely transforming our um, data warehouse environment. So we're using in-memory analytics from SAP, HANA, mm -hmm. and we're bringing all that data into that environment. And then we're using that environment as kind of the nucleus of a machine learning platform where we can put advanced analytics of a variety of sorts on top of that data lake, that big okay. data lake. Uh, and use that to drive all sorts of interesting things we might want to do in a university setting. Yeah. What sort of, when I, th when I think about data lakes, especially versus data warehousing, I think of data lakes as having more diverse and structured and unstructured data in them. Am I correct in that? Uh, yes, I do. I think you are correct, structured and unstructured, but structured is a continuum. So, oh, um, okay. You know, you could have lightly structured data, heavily structured data. Uh, the reality is most places, both businesses and universities, have still not tapped their structured data well enough. Okay. And when you enter the machine learning world and the AI world, while it's very good at unstructured data, wherever there is structure, that even enriches the models more mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. So we're taking kind of a both-and approach. We're trying to enrich our structured, our sense of the structure of our data in this very clearly articulated what we call activity hub design, as well as enable uh, unstructured analytics as well. Okay. So I think it's a both and. It's okay. not an either or. All right. Um, the Can you give me an idea of the size and the scope of your data lake? How much, how much data is in your lake? Oh. oh. Um, <laughs> how fast is it growing? How many people have to tend to it? Yeah, we've got uh, a team of about 15 in our BI team okay. and, and data and, and data warehousing team that attend to the data. So it's it's a generous team of higher ed standards, but not a huge team uh, and not a big team at all. Uh, the amount of data we have for university on the structured side, you know, it's comprising our finance system, our HR system, our uh, payroll systems, our student systems, et cetera, with 10, 15 years of data. So we're going to... You know, we're not going to be in this 30, 40, 50 terabyte range, but we'll be pretty close to that when we're done. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's all in memory. It's highly compressed, so it, it, mm -hmm. it, it ends up being even smaller than you'd realize. It's the unstructured realm that actually that you point out, that's, that's where it gets very big quick. For yes. example, we're going to be ingesting uh, learning events from our LMS, our learning management system. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the interactions instructors and students will have in the LMS. That gives us very cl good clues as to what's working in the LMS, what's not, yeah. and how to improve the educational experience for the student. Well, that's capable of throwing off millions of rows per week 
mm-hmm. um, and we can get into the billions of rows uh, with just a few years. So with that in mind, we're also pairing up our in-memory analytics with a serverless peta, peta scale, petabyte uh-huh. scale type data lake environment as well. Okay. Now, is a learning management system, is that the higher ed equivalent of an ERP system? No, it's, it's, it, it exists in higher ed and corporations. It's a place where students go in to get their course material, interact, okay. or actually have their course content delivered. Oh, all right. Vi- video mm-hmm. streaming, for example, if you were to record what we're doing here today as one big video stream, we can put that up into the learning management system. Mm-hmm. And students who are in the class could replay this to their heart's content over and over again. I would hope they'd want to, to find out what their CIO is up to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But there's very interesting um, uh, use cases that come out of this. For example, as we're talking here, I might use a phrase that the listener might not know, and they're watching this, replaying it at night. Mm -hmm. And if they're searching three or four times for this peculiar phrase, we'll call it digital transformation, uh, we we can have two hypotheses about that activity. One, they're very confused, or two, they're very interested. Yeah. With the assumption they're probably confused. Well, imagine the technology (laughs) suddenly alerts an expert who says, oh, are you listening to Mary, Fran, and Vince talk about digital transformation? No, no, here's what they mean. And that person can call them up on their cell phone right in the middle of. Mm -hmm. It sounds creepy, but if you turn it into a value-add opt-in service where you can get just-in-time tutoring uh, while you're interacting with your course material, that's not a bad example right. of how the technology can enrich the environment. Or yes. even just simpler things like the technology inserting uh, some content relevant to the discussion that's going on automatically for the learner. Okay. Well, considering the enormous modernization system you have going on, and I think you said one way to think about it is that not a single part of IT will be unscathed, that everything is getting changed. Uh, This is a process that you started when you got there about two years ago. Correct. Tell, Tell me what sort of structural uh, type changes you've made uh, in the IT group. Talk a little bit about the size and scope of it and how IT is organized differently now to deliver all of this change that you have going on. Yeah, we're about 400 uh, IT staff Mm -hmm. uh, servicing the institution at the central level. We have a Another IT group that handles our healthcare side of life with a separate CIO, so I'm going to set them aside. And mm-hmm. then we've got probably an equivalent number of IT people sprinkled across the university, mainly in the area of researcher support and faculty support. Okay. Um, our research business is a $1.2 billion business just by itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got 400 staff uh, here. We've had to, what we've done in the last year is we've stood up an enterprise architecture function Mm -hmm. Uh, it has about seven enterprise architects in it we've stood up a project management function with a very strong discipline around project management Uh, we've stood up a total quality management uh, function uh, that handles uh, the continued education of IT on Lean Six Sigma we're a Lean Six Sigma shop Mm -hmm. we put all 400 employees through Lean Six Sigma yellow belt training we've got about 15 plus who are green belt certified and we probably have three or four black belt level Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the training that we did in this of all 400 people getting some process training in Lean Six Sigma has resulted in 1,800 employees total now at the university have been through Lean Six Sigma training, with more coming. I wondered if it extended beyond IT people, if they're also on the business side. It did, and it extended extended bottom up. So we've added some of those pieces to our structure, and then uh, the the bigger changes are going to occur when we start to empty our data centers. One data center is empty. We're going to empty the other one in the next two years, Mm -hmm. and then we'll be pretty much 100% cloud or 90% cloud with some older systems that don't lend themselves to the cloud still being run on-prem, but mm-hmm. in a colo facility versus uh, within a data center that we're running. Okay. And you're also in the process of, I think, standing up a data sciences operations group. Yes. As part of it, we're looking at how do we support all the analytical work that's going to need to happen. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at a data science operations group, which has two main functions. One of them is to handle data logistics, Mm -hmm. how to move data in and out of these environments, uh, hopefully real time and incremental. 
uh, via modern technologies in the cloud. And then the second piece is how do you uh, design the different forms of an analysis needed from mm -hmm. data architecture right to designing uh, a machine learning approach uh, to tackling an analytical puzzle. Interesting. Well, and, and you had mentioned too that what you're doing, you don't consider it DevOps or even data ops, but DS ops, data science ops. Is that yes. A, so that's going to be the next new thing after DevOps? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, when you go to the cloud in a software as a service solution where you're now kind of out of the software engineering game, mm -hmm. um, which I think is appropriate uh, because software engineering is what I call the Lebray tar pit for the naively over optimistic. Everybody jumps in thinking they can do software. And then uh, when they write a bunch of software seven years later, they got to rewrite it. And now yeah. they're looking just like any of the big software houses faced with rewriting their software. Yeah. And we often don't include those costs. So when we go to the mm -hmm. cloud and software as a service, that activity drops down rather significantly. What doesn't change is the need to integrate data between various systems. Um, while we're going to have an ERP system, we have another 15, 20 systems around that that comprise to make up the various pieces of software we need to run our business here. That data has to get moved in and out of those mm -hmm. and into our analytical environment. So there's this data movement piece that has to get tackled. Uh, and then uh, the, so the, op, the, the, the development activity now will be how to create quick integration points very quickly when new mm -hmm. software comes on board or changes. And then secondly, how to create data science packages and workloads. Mm -hmm. And get them working in the environment. So development, instead of being DevOps, meaning we're developing software and then moving into operations and improving that cycle, now we're trying to bring on stores of data, get them integrated, and get the analytical routines built quickly. So that's what I call data science ops. Data science ops. It's it's cool. It sounds like it's uh, very much the next steps uh, that a lot of big enterprises will be encountering. I think that's where we should be. I mean, mm -hmm. data is at the core of competitiveness for human beings and businesses, so yeah. we should do everything we can to shore that up. Mm -hmm. Well, and with the four books you've written on database technology, it looks like you picked a really good part of IT to have your expertise in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I torture my staff with my questions, but <laughs> so far they've been I was wondering, very good at correcting yeah, me. I was wondering how hands-on you get with the DS Ops teams, whether they hide when they see you coming. <laughs> Um, in some areas, I'm deeply in touch with some details, but they're all very skilled, very capable people, and they're very good at telling me when I'm all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me see. Another, um, uh, you mentioned the Lean Six Sigma and the training around that. Is that something that you, that came with you when you joined UC San Diego? Uh, was that new to, or, or was that already underway? when you got there? Uh, it was new to the organization. Okay. Uh, University of California, San Diego has been doing Lean Six Sigma training uh, to the outside world Yeah. Uh, through our extension group. And we have an internal, I think it was an, a small internal consulting group called our Office of Strategic Initiatives where mm -hmm. they've been doing some Lean Six Sigma training. Ah. I'm a big believer in total quality management and process thinking. Yeah. And so that uh, IT gets very skilled in that. And when I came in, I said, wow, I've got these capabilities here. Let's use them to train us how to do Lean Six Sigma. So, yes, I, yes. I brought that in. I've been doing that my whole career everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. well, uh, And that started back from my oil and gas days. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a um, like you were essentially resolving a shoemaker's children issue, you know, where there was yeah. plenty. There was Lean Six Sigma training going on, but not targeted inwardly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. All right. One of the other things uh, we talked about was the way the, the, the types of vendors and the relationships with vendors, how that's changing as you go more toward the cloud. And you mentioned that you're, uh, you're basically working with the big three, with Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. How has this changed your role as the CIO? Or do you see any difference uh, in between working with, you know, the famous well-known on-prem vendors, and then as you move more to cloud vendors, what sort of differences do you see? Yeah, I think that the biggest change for me is we move to the cloud as I get much more involved in contracting issues. Yes. And contracting terms mm -hmm. and service level agreements and limits of liability. 
fortunately, I got some background uh, running in buying and selling businesses in the past. At least I have some a little bit of knowledge there. Mm-hmm. But I spend way more time uh, knifing into those issues and serving as a negotiator on behalf of the institution for those vendors. Yes. Um, and then trying to figure out solutions uh, to that contracting puzzle. Mm-hmm. Uh, because many of the what we'll call the hyperscale vendors want to give you a standard click-through agreement uh, that isn't very customized. Right. And most bigger enterprises do not like doing that, so we end up having to talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also spend a, f- a fair bit more time trying to make sure I understand the, each of those vendors' product strategies, uh, where they're going. Yeah, the roadmap is very because important. Yeah, They're coming up with lots of tools and technologies very quick. Uh, Amazon's been setting the way there with new products, you know, a pace of new product development that's been very fast. Uh, you got serverless technology coming in. Uh, you've got uh, uh, FPGA, field, point, f- field programmable gate arrays. You've got uh, TPUs, TensorFlows, mm-hmm. uh, and other things that these vendors are coming out with quickly. So I spent much more time trying to understand their product roadmaps than yeah. I had done in the past. Yeah, and to figure out what you're entitled to without extra charges in your contracts. Absolutely. Yeah. Maximizing the contract. Yeah, we've been doing a, a new session for the last few months at my CIO Perspective series, and we call it the Trouble with Cloud Contracts. And we have an IT uh, an IT attorney who joins me on that discussion, and I get a couple of CIOs who are in various stages of negotiation with cloud vendors. And then we do yeah. a workshop around it, and people are it's been very popular because everybody is finding out how different it is. Yeah, there's been a... Uh... I started working several years ago with a firm called Strategic Blue out of the UK, which had started very early with the birth of Amazon Web Services on cloud brokerage and cloud reselling. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this particular firm takes a different look at it. They take a look at it that's coming from other commodity industries like the energy business and how deals and contracts get structured there. Mm And uh, Strategic, Blue, Strategic Blue has been analyzing this concept of cloud sprawl, meaning you have all your workloads mm-hmm. in the cloud and you think you're cheaper, but the reality is you're consuming the cloud in such a way that you're probably spending twice what you should be. Ah. In addition, you got these mm-hmm. on-demand workloads versus these pre-purchased or, or reserved instance workloads in, in yeah. Amazon terms mm-hmm. that have significant price differences and how to take advantage of wherever you can, the lowest cost reserved instances, and essentially mm-hmm. pre-committing your 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 spend. All of that is very complex in these environments now. Yeah, uh, it's computationally, it's actually a big data science problem too. It is. Well, and I was yeah, just thinking so. that uh, so many CIOs at some point in their career path have gone back to business school to get an MBA, and I wonder, yeah. I wonder at what point uh, they will start going to law school. And making sure they yeah. have a, j- a Juris Doctor to go along with their qualifications. Well, I, th- I think our future is going to be much more in the realm of supply chain expert mm-hmm. on oh, how to and, and and the other thing I do in the cloud now. When you go to the cloud, I actually have to understand regional networking. Mm-hmm. And how do the clouds connect to each other across uh, the world? What's their redundancy strategy? So I'm very involved in. Vince, can you hear me? We lost your sound there for a second. Can you hear me? Sorry oh, about that. We're there back. you are. You're back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think I think our future is going to be in the realm of uh, of of looking at the supply chain for data mm-hmm. and and technology, and working out all of the logistic price contractual issues. Okay. Fair enough. Well, and when we were talking earlier about uh, your top technology and your top business issues. When I asked you about the top business issue, you mentioned how important it is for the university to grow the digital education products. Is that is that your number one kind of the business goal that you're focused on? It's one of them. We okay. have a couple of we have a couple of key goals, and certainly we've got an initiative here at San Diego called our Strategic Academic Program Development Initiative, which is looking at ways of mixing on-premise and digital Mm -hmm. learning experiences cleverly together. Mm 
Yes. And mm -hmm. it's reaching out to our faculty uh, under the guidance of our uh, EVC, Elizabeth Simmons. And uh, the faculty are coming up with a number of proposals. Mm -hmm. What we're doing in technology is making sure that all of our core content can be distributed across a variety of channels, distribution channels. Okay. Uh, and so we're trying to adopt a more modern sort of web-based distribution approach to our content. Interesting. And, and so that's happening now, and, and we want to grow that significantly over the next five years. Mm -hmm. Does that lead you into hiring in different skill sets and talents into the IT group than you have needed in the past? Or is all this um, kind of evolving? It's, it's more of an evolution. We've always needed what we call instructional designers and instructional designer technologists, mm -hmm. people who are very familiar with the technology around instruction and the techniques for doing so. Yeah. Um, we just now uh, have to do a few, hire a few more of them to handle this particular work. Uh, I think the analytics side is, is much more interesting here because all these in tools have data and there's a need for faculty and others to analyze that data to look at how well the students are doing. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's creating a need for learning uh, data scientists. Data scientists familiar with learning theory and how to apply uh, the theory of learning into analyzing the data. Okay. Um, when you think about the way the IT organization is evolving your own there at UC San Diego and also what you hear about when you get together with other higher ed CIOs how how is it changing what are some of the near term skill shifts and and talent challenges that higher ed specifically is facing over the next few years Hmm. From an IT standpoint, uh, uh, the biggest one right now that we're all harping on is security. Uh, oh, okay. We, have we haven't talked about that yet. Yeah. Yeah, we, we haven't, mm -hmm. you know, security professionals are in such hot demand. If they're good, they can leave quickly uh, mm -hmm. for better opportunities in industry. So in higher ed, we have a harder time trying to keep them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's obviously one key area. I think this realm of, of workers who are extremely shrewd in different forms of data design, data architecture, and data analytics and machine learning, that's mm -hmm. the next one. Okay. That's a scarce skill set that's hard to get a hold of. Yeah. Um, and so th those are probably the top two. Uh, obviously, project management looms larger in this, in, in this sort of data science ops world mm -hmm. and use of cloud providers. Uh, where we're structuring projects to deliver new products. Um, so sometimes that's a skill set, but uh, it's not necessarily the hot one. I think the two biggest ones are security and data. Right. That's the okay. biggest holes. Yeah, that, that would make sense. Is the university doing anything either with a, a planned digital offering? I, I, you know, it makes sense that you're trying to develop more data scientists. Do you also have cybersecurity course offerings or...? Uh, we have some at the university here. That's not necessarily a big focus area for the university, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, we have within our engineering school uh, ability to take courses in that area. Um, and so at our university, not so much, but there are other mm -hmm. universities that have uh, very strong uh, security training and courses available. Mm -hmm. uh, vendors have a bunch too. There's certification you can get in security independent of a university. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think the shortage is so much of educational opportunities. It's just a shortage of people taking advantage of them as oh, this see. demand is growing so quickly. Yeah. Well, a lot of the CIOs that I talk with, we always, uh, especially when we start talking about cybersecurity, we always talk about the talent challenges. And so many of them have had to fall back on developing their own you know, ro yep. basically growing and rolling your own uh, security people. And a lot of times they come out of data center and engineering areas. Yes, that's yeah. correct. And we're starting to adopt that approach here by ramping up our use of student interns and recent student graduates. Mm -hmm. Even okay. if they can't stay with the university long term, we want to at least take advantage of them as long as we can. Yeah, yeah. Every bit of experience helps, doesn't it? Um, yeah. I, I want to talk more about, uh, you had mentioned the um, um, projects that are producing products. That's You and I talked a little bit about yeah. that. I've, I've run into some CIOs in certain kinds of companies where IT has been reorganized to think more like 
product teams than just project managers. And often that there is a lot of agile development going on. There's a lot of collaboration and business people. In fact, sometimes the product managers are business people that are part of a particular team. And you had an interesting reaction to that, that you've got product areas, but you've also got a lot of service areas. So for UC San Diego, that doesn't necessarily make sense. No, I mean, if you're going to create product in a development environment, yeah. a DevOps environment, yes, you, you're going to have uh, an approach, both on the project management side and on the sales side, of how to create that product, how to market it, how to bring it to market. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you get to now having a large number of customers consuming that product, you're probably not going to use the exact same product function that created it to service it and most large software vendors don't okay the the, mm -hmm. the servicing uh, the customer servicing comes in a different way and so in higher ed most higher ed shops in it are about 80 percent uh services not uh, you know mandatory services we have to deliver 20 percent of our work is in what we call product development or projects mm -hmm. Uh, so we're largely service-based. It requires a different structure that I think is optimized for handling the call, the request, mm -hmm. optimizing the phone, optimizing uh, email inquiries and web inquiries, and then proactively identifying where the improvement areas are. Uh, I think the reason everybody's spinning over to product mm -hmm. is, you know, product management is many of the software, big software houses since the 80s have been doing that. And so the product manager's defined role her, certainly was defined at Microsoft long mm -hmm. ago and other places. And industry is starting to adopt that. Mm -hmm. I think they're also adopting it because of the failure of the project management discipline yeah. uh, to really deliver on its promise. Mm -hmm. And so to me, we're certainly bringing in a flavor of product management to my unit, but we're also very much beefing up what we're doing in terms of project management as well. Yeah. Because the reality is a product manager uses project managers in order to deliver the product. Of course, of course. Well, in a, a few of the places that have switched over to thinking about it more in terms of products and products, product teams, talk about how differently the IT people start think about the work that they're doing. It's not just a, you know, get in there and get it done and move on to the next thing. It's more involvement, I guess, over the lifespan yeah. of it. So yeah. that makes a difference. Yeah. That's attitudinally a big difference. It does. And um, the IT worker then gets committed to building a product and releasing it. Mm -hmm. uh, although in many cases in higher ed, we're, our teams are divided up by product definitions anyway. Yeah. So, for yeah. example, I've got a team focused on students, our student system, and that's their product. That's their baby. They're vested. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think if, you, if you're using product management to solve a motivational issue, that's not the only tool in your arsenal. You've got other tools well, you can point. use, too. Okay. Give me a for instance. What other tools would you use? Um, well, uh, one that I've continue to do to this day that I've always believed in is I, I like my staff to develop their own passion inventory. Ah. So, uh, and then I like to see where we have training or what I call learning opportunities for them that it's aligned to their passion. Uh huh. So I always keep talking to my, uh, both my senior managers next, and the next layer down is what we do here is we align passion to mission. Huh. So you have to, and some employees, have, the passion leaps up, they're passionate, they absolutely want to do it, and, and they tell you about it. Some employees are not that way. They're a mm -hmm. little more quiet, or they're not certain what their passion is. Yeah. Uh, what we have to do with every employee is reach them and find out where their passion is. Make sure it's in a place of most premise for them, mm -hmm. meaning it's something they can actually do. Yeah. And then get them on it. Now, if it's taking them out of their current line of work, I better do it because if I don't, they will do that. Yeah. All, the, all good employees will follow their passion regardless of the job you've given them. I've, I don't think I've ever heard of a passion inventory. Is that like a, um, a bucket list for work projects that I love? <laughs> um, yeah, or you can think of it as a little bit broader. Mm -hmm. What is, why am I here in this earth? Ah. What do I want to accomplish? Yeah. And I'll give you a counterintuitive one. Years ago, when I was CIO at DePaul, I talked to an employee about his passion. He said, well, my passion is music. 
I have this computer job so I can get money to do my passion. Oh, okay. I said, okay, how can I help you get on your passion? He said, well, if I could have a slightly more flexible schedule, that would really help me. Mm -hmm. I said, great. I think we can accommodate that. There we go. You gave him practice time. <laughs> yeah. Meaning I, he was in a role where it's easily, we could easily put him in some flex time yeah. and, and slide a schedule around. It actually was beneficial for us because he was in a, is in a key, what we call field support role mm -hmm. where that makes great sense, especially seasonally. Yeah. And so it was a win-win. Mm -hmm. Now it wouldn't have come up if I hadn't asked, what's your real passion here? Right. Right. And a lot of us are afraid to do that, but I feel like a good employee is going to follow their passion. They just won't tell you. Mm -hmm. So it's better to get out. And yeah, that's, out that's a good page. point. They're going to know what their passion points are. It's whether or not they have the level of trust with you that they will share it. Well, that's the key. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. So when we start to do organizational restructuring, Mm-hmm. And terms like product management, et cetera, mm -hmm. as kind of a way of getting at that basic trust and passion alignment, hmm. just you, you cut through that. Just go right to the to the passion yeah. and the trust. Yeah. When you got strong passion, strong trust, any structure will do. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great point. I want to circle back on one thing and ask you to talk a little bit about the approach you do take to project management, because you've been deploying, developed and deploying a statistical project management approach. And I, hadn't, I had not heard anyone talk about it in this kind of level of detail before. So tell me about the project manager role that you have at UC San Diego and how it's different from what you might right. think of as a run-of-the-mill project manager role. Right. And... The difference in the role for that we're trying to define here at San Diego and have defined and have started to deploy is the project manager is looking broadly at the level of volatility or difficulty in the project mm -hmm. versus trying to understand all the dependencies of the project. So I'm going to go to the heart of this matter. Um, in the project management discipline, there's a lot of discussion in, in the training on how to estimate mm -hmm. and then how to capture when value is being delivered. And a lot of it is through modeling the dependencies carefully and modeling the resources aligned carefully. Okay. Well, those are two very difficult things. And as you start to model dependencies and you start to change them, you suddenly see wild shifts in the project budget and duration, which project managers that hunt down and track. The reality is, especially in an agile product world, the date is fixed. So the date is set. The work is done to hit that date. So in our approach, rather than try to model dependencies, mm -hmm. instead we just define a project or product as having things in it that the user is getting. We call those objects. An object is meant to be tangible, concrete. Two or three independent observers can look at it and say, I know what that is, but I think that's a simple object, mm -hmm. or that's a complex one. An example might be in, in a analytical environment, we're going to deliver a Tableau workbook with seven pages on it. Yeah. And each page is going to have a different visual. That's an object that I can get my arm, arm around. Then what we do is we build the project plan and we get time entry for everybody working on all projects. Um, being occurring on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And then the project manager is looking at how well the teams are delivering on the estimate for creation of that object. Okay. And that's now getting in this realm of statistics. Mm -hmm. So the, the goal here is to have a large number of tasks, small number of hours per task, roughly about 12 hours per task, a high closure rate on tasks as we each week goes by following more of an agile approach. Mm -hmm. And then a very quick retrospective that says, hey, of the 30 tests we just closed off, were we over and under? Ah. How much? And so we've worked out certainly all the numbers for the over and under component, but also different forms of volatility. Mm -hmm. uh, our ability to hit the estimate, how frequently we're re-estimating. What I call procrastination, are the teams delaying work until the last minute? Yeah. Uh, and all that gives the project manager clues as to what's going on with the project. And more importantly, let's pinpoint 
on where in the project to put their effort and in a large portfolio of projects, which projects are the ones that are problematic. Okay. Statistically driven versus causally driven. Yeah. Um, Hence, the project manager doesn't need to know deeply the technology in it. Right. And it sounds almost like the kind of approach that a data scientist would take to project management. Yes, that's yes. correct. <laughs> that, that stuff is sneaking in everywhere, isn't it? I um, think that's what we, got. we deliberately instrumented the whole project delivery piece with a whole bunch of daily measures yeah. that turned into different volatility scores. Yeah. Um, Vince, your sound quality is a little bit uh, shaky. I'm wondering, have you leaned yeah, let me, back? Let me, Stay yeah, let me try this. There you go. Stay close to your machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, last thing I wanted in the last few minutes, I wanted to wrap up talking about how you approach and support innovation inside of IT. I mean, there's it's always I, I find CIOs usually fall into either a uh, a structured approach to it or more unstructured. But it's one of those topics where if you're not encouraging and talking about innovation, it's hard to identify it. You know, you, I suppose people know it when they see it, but most CIOs have an approach to it. So how do you do that? Uh, I would call it semi-structured. Okay. Uh, we have, um, for example, we're, we're, we did an innovation on this cloud optimization, cloud brokering piece. Okay. But we deliberately are putting it through this stage gate methodology where the idea has to prove itself out at different stages. Mm -hmm. So that's a more structured approach. Um, in the area of learning analytics, we're going to go out to the faculty with uh, their innovations, and that'll be a little bit less structured in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think the approach we take here is going to vary depending on the, on the, on the, on the context. I think if you get overly structured in innovation, it probably isn't innovation. Innovation can be very messy. Yeah. And so you got to give it enough room and enough protection so that it can go through its messy birthing phase. Yeah, because so there has to be a lot of failure with innovation because you have to be able to try things. Yeah, absolutely. And the, yeah. and the people in it, that's why it's hard to do innovation inside an enterprise because people are very risk averse inside an enterprise. That's why they're in the enterprise. So they're not out <laughs> being their own entrepreneur. Yes, exactly. So they're afraid to get on a venture that might be a failure. So you got to give them protection as well. Mm hmm uh, so you, know, you have to think very hard about how to do the innovation internally. Yeah. Um, and some of the innovation can occur in partnership with a vendor. So I'm a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. uh, vendor brings some perspective and some skin in the game and some rigor to it as well. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's always that always tends to turn a vendor relationship into more of a partnership. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned too that in a, in a university setting, you can use the research domain as an incubation ecosystem. How do you do that at UC San Diego? Ah, well, in fact, with with our uh, uh, with our analytics environment, we're about to do that. We're about to go out to the faculty and say we have these large collections of data. Mm -hmm that we certainly want to use from an administrative standpoint. But in your research domain, you might have insight into how to tackle this. And uh -huh. so I'm sitting down with our, our teaching and learning center director, Gabrielle Wienhausen, and she's putting together her, her learning data scientist positions. And the purpose for that is to then work with the faculty on the data we're collecting on mm -hmm. innovative uses of that data within their teaching and instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's, uh, one way we're trying to tackle that. So I look at the faculty as kind of a, a crowdsourced environment, so to speak. Yes. Or I call it community sourced. Mm -hmm. So IT doesn't have to be the font of all wisdom. It can community source things out. In fact, yes. we're doing that with analytics writ large. We're trying to say IT cannot tackle all the innovation and analytics. We've got to get everybody engaged. So we're yes. adopting this what I call community sourced model with a community practice manager. Mm. I like that terminology better, actually, community sourced. Crowdsourcing always sounds like something on the edge of a riot to me. Yeah. You know, it, it sounds yeah. a little too chaotic. Um, one of the things you mentioned was that uh, you've got a performance evaluation tool that started out as research and a pretty cool idea and is now something used widely. The yeah, it's it started out as an innovation work in one of our academic colleges divisions mm -hmm. um, and got popular there and got used throughout uh, the university. And then just recently, we've raised it to the level we call an enterprise application uh, mm -hmm. and are hardening it a little bit more. 
and then bringing it forward. And that's an example of what I call community source software development. In mm -hmm. fact, in our new enterprise system and data warehousing environment, we got a robust API strategy because we want to have an API economy fueling this innovation potential where yeah. people can get at the core administrative data safely, but do their innovations. Okay, excellent. Well, and as we uh, we wrap up here, we are at our one hour mark. I'm always so amazed at how fast the hour goes by. I always yeah. like uh, I like to give people an opportunity to just give a parting bit of advice to other CIOs, maybe who've been listening to the kind of issues you're dealing with and things you're talking about. What are uh, what is a piece of advice for CIOs who want to encourage more innovation, who want to get their enterprises moving more quickly toward data science and toward the future? What do you advise? Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, <laughs> it's a multi-level plan, probably yeah. six or seven levels that have to be well orchestrated. Uh, like a three, but... 3D chess game. It's, yeah, a yeah. 3D chess game. And then mm -hmm. you need uh, a lot of good people to help drive it. And for all the good people who might be listening to this too, uh, there's no better time to be in technology than now. I've been in it my whole adult career, and it's been the most wild and fascinating right now. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is wonderful. And it's been wonderful having you with us here today. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. We could go for another hour. I'm afraid so, yes, yes. But they're, they're going to kick me out of the studio here, so we will have to wrap thank up. You. Thank you so much for spending the thank time you. with us today, Vince. Now, if you joined us late, and uh, you can still watch the full episode later today on CIO.com, or you can listen to an audio podcast of my conversation with Vince wherever you get your podcasts. And I wanted to invite you also to join us for our next episode on Tuesday, December 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern. I'll be joined by CIO Elizabeth Hackinson, who is with Schneider Electric and has in the past worked at AES Corporation. So we thank you very much for joining us today at CIO Leadership Live, and I'll see you next time. Take care.